Good evening and welcome to the X-Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City where courageous people come forward and share their journey from the religion of Mormonism to a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. I praise God and I'm grateful for the volunteers and those who make this possible. Before we turn our attention to our guest tonight, I'd like to offer a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your spirit to be with us tonight, that the, thing, that the things that are said will edify you, that will touch hearts, and hearts will be softened. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our guest tonight is Mariner Merrill. We welcome you, Mariner. Thank you. Thanks for coming. What a great name, Mariner. You, yeah. Could you explain that a little bit to us? I'm named after my great-great-grandfather. He was an uh, LDS apostle. And was he? Yeah, settled Cache Valley and built the Logan Temple. Wow. And as an apostle to, uh, to Brigham, Brigham Young, Young I yep. guess. Yep. Wow. And you, so you were named after him. Is that a name that's carried through your family, I suppose? Yeah, I have a lot of cousins. And, yeah. Well, tell us, how long have you, you been, you, were you born in a member of the church? I was. I was born LDS and very active family. And you uh, have been, were active as a youth? and. Yep. Tell yeah. us about that just a little bit. It was youngest of six kids. The older four were quite a bit older than my sister and I, but um, we were very active in the church and, you know, did all the steps of baptism at eight and coming to deacon at 12 and... Scouts and... Scouts and... Yeah. Take yeah, seminary, did you? And yep. Seminary. Everything right there in Utah Valley. Utah Valley. Yeah. Oh, and so you'd moved, or the family had moved from Cache Valley, I guess. And oh, no, it's my family history started in Cache Valley. Cache Valley. Yeah. Okay. It's raised in. So, kind of a normal, would you consider your family life fairly normal? Yeah. And, and your folks were active? And, yeah. And, yeah, uh, okay. There. And so, you turned 19, and what? Yeah. You decided to go on a mission. I did. I did. Now, before you went on your mission, I understand you talked to the stake president. You had some questions. I, and I did. There was, a, you know, and I don't remember the specifics now, but there was a few questions I had that I couldn't get a good answer from my parents or leaders or whatever, and I brought to him, and he Doctrinal really... Doctrinal questions? Yeah, or? and uh, church history questions, and... You know, I, t I struggled with them. I said, I really want to resolve this before I go out and preach in the, the LDS religion and stuff. And he said, just, he said, there's lots and lots of things like that. He, was, he works at BYU. I think he still does. He's been there forever. But he says he has a shelf in his mind. Just put that stuff on a shelf. And someday you might be able to figure it out. But if not, do you just keep going? And <laughs> it was a little bit frustrating, but I thought I'll trust him. And Okay. You know, just go on. So with you it. went ahead on your mission, and you went yeah. to uh, to Detroit. Okay. And how did that go? Went really good. I loved it. You know, hit the ground running. Had a lot of success. Oh, good. Um, and uh, tell us about your the rest of your experience there. And um, it went good at first for the first few months, and it was still good. Um, started to have some strange experiences with uh, leadership on my mission. Uh, one of my district leaders. Uh, We'd do splits, you know, like mm -hmm. some of the missionaries, you'd, you'd trade partners basically sure. for a day or whatever. And um, one of the, the district's leader's companion, I went with him one day, and he, he said he was really frustrated because every day we'd go and park, he would go and park at the high school to watch the girls come out of school oh. at 3 o'clock. Oh, my. And I <laughs> thought, well, this guy's, you know, and it's the same guy that's riding us for our numbers, and you guys got to do this, and you guys got to do that, and it... That kind of hypocrisy was kind of hard yes. thinking, and you know, and we'd go into the district meetings, and he would say how he's got the, in his patriarchal blessing, he had the gift of discernment, and he knew if we were lying about our numbers and all this stuff, and I just, you know, come on, was, a lot of demands know. on a mission, that's for sure. Yeah, and I knew I knew it was pretty bogus to be doing one thing and acting like acting a, another. Yeah, so that that was kind of frustrating. Um, Another one had an experience involving the mission president. So we had this um, couple from down south that moved up to Detroit, and we didn't know much about them, but they were on church welfare before they were even baptized. That's what they told us. And um, the really strange couple, and I always had a hard time going there. Hmm. And we were, we were kind of in the stage of fellowshipping them. They'd been baptized recently, and so the mission president, you guys go over there and fellowship and do this and try and get them friends with people in the ward. And, 
stuff like that. So we did that, but it's always uncomfortable there. Just always uncomfortable. And I called him one night and, and talked to the, you know the mission president and said, I'm just uncomfortable going here. You know, there's there's a bad feeling in the home. The 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 father has these attack dogs. He's six and he sends them right up to you and they bark and then he calls them to stop. And I'm like, the guy's weird. And he said, you know, he said, don't you question anything. You keep going there and and uh, you fellowship him. You just do what you're told and said, okay. But anyway, we go over there one shortly after, a few days later, and everything's gone. There's just a little bit of stuff left, but they're gone, their car's gone. We're like, what in the world? And turns out the guy's wanted for murder. Oh my. He's wanted for murder down south. They've just been going from church to church and... Getting whatever they could. Yeah, and oh. investigators are looking for him. And yeah. come to find out the mission president met him somewhere and he baptized him. So he was really concerned with them. And oh. to me, this was really difficult because I thought... Again, the discernment. Yes, yeah. exactly. I, it was hard for me. I thought... If this priesthood is so real and this, this spirit is supposed to be telling priesthood leaders all this stuff and someone in that position as being a mission president sure. in charge of all those elders and shouldn't, shouldn't he have a little more discernment? I know people make mistakes, but I thought that was... So how did that impact sorry. your mission? Uh, it was really discouraging to me because I felt like I had had impressions that was ignored, you know. Yeah. I told him I felt really uncomfortable there. And, and you ended up coming home a little early. Yeah. I did. It wasn't long after when I just, just about the year mark, I had enough and... You just told the mission president... Totally lost too. motivation, yeah. Now, of course, the LDS would take a, a view of that, that you were not fulfilling your responsibility or that oh, yeah. you were weak or something. What, uh, yeah, I was, what was the reaction? I was really, really depressed. Were you? Just very depressed. I just came home. I felt like... Felt guilty. I or? wasn't going to have that label because growing up LDS, you want to be an, an RM or whatever right. to be a stand up guy or whatever. If right. you're not a return missionary, then it's like, ah, you're second class at least, yeah. you know, or lower. And so I felt like I'd really, really failed. How was and, your Mormon life after that, immediately after? Did um, you, uh, were you active at all or did you? I stay? tried to be, but. I just, it was hard, it was difficult for me. Yeah. It was really difficult for me. And I understand you ran into a little difficulty a little later on and yeah, you I did. I excommunicated. Yes, I had some moral problems and mm. you know, that age I wanted to party and stuff a little yeah. bit and and did, got excommunicated pretty quick. But then quick. you had a desire to come back to the church. I did. And how did that go? It was mostly my sister's wedding. I thought I really want to be there in the temple. I knew she wanted me there and at the same time, not enough for me to change how I was. And I, and I was starting to lose my belief in priesthood leadership and just question things and wonder what's going on. And mm -hmm. something I couldn't pinpoint that just wasn't quite right, that wasn't adding up. And um, But you still went through the process of I did. becoming I started, temple worthy. Yes, I started doing it, went to my bishop and said, I've been good. And you know, I have answered all the questions right and said, yes, I'm worthy. And he said, yeah, okay, that's great. And you are worthy. And I thought, well, he should have caught that. And I thought, I'm going to keep testing this because I want to I wanted know if there's something really here or not. If they you know? really can tell. or yeah, And I went on to the stake president and said, yeah, I'm worthy, and even though I wasn't. And said, I'm totally worthy, and I want to go to my sister's wedding. And, this. and he said, okay, yeah. You, you know, and, and sent me on to the to the church office building in Salt Lake. I had to go there to get or reordain. another interview or a 70 Yeah, or go through an interview with the 70 and then he did a blessing or something that reinstated me as a member. And I remember going there just scared to death. Like, Thinking, he was gonna, he, yeah, somebody's gonna catch this. I think I literally was physically sweating from stress for the first time and going in there and I'm like, I'm gonna be so busted. This was so stupid, you know. That was such a bad idea. But I went in, you know, nice gentleman, everything you expect from a big LDS leader and nice office and everything. And we sat down and talked. And um, I don't remember much details, but I remember being terrified. But I told him I was worthy as the day is long. And I'd been chased and I'm living this and paying tithing and all that. And and he prayed and and went on about the Lord telling him, how grateful he was that I'd repented and changed my life and come back to the true fold and all this, and I was just sick. 
Because you knew then that yeah. he didn't have any insight. And I thought, person. here I am up on whatever floor of the church office building with one of the 70, and he's looking at me telling me this information that I know darn well to be un untrue. Yeah. And that he heard that from God, and I thought, what more do I need? So how did all this impact you then for, for, the, for the next few years? Um, it was pretty frustrating yeah. because I didn't know where to go. I had, there was a special Easter that I had in my memory. But, um, Emotional? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. But I had a testimony of the Savior. You know, I just, um, but now the testimony of who I thought was his representatives was, um, I mean, all this time you'd believed in the Book of yeah. Mormon and, and the Joseph Smith and the First Vision. Yeah. You loved God. Absolutely. But you weren't sure about this religion that was... Yeah, and so know. my whole framework of reality is kind of starting to crumble. Yeah. You know, and, and I felt that um, starting to... I didn't know how to get to God anymore because <laughs> my whole reality was... I knew that wasn't the way. Whatever that was, it wasn't working. And yet it you had this real. love for God that you yeah. wanted to develop, and, and how did you, what did you do to... Well, I'll tell you what, I, I pushed it out of the way for years, because did I didn't know what to do. I'm, I did have this, I had this job where I worked midnights, and on, first thing in the morning, the only thing on was this preacher. And I started to hear, I started to hear that in the morning, and it, it became like my little guilty pleasure. Because <laughs> it was just straight preaching right out of the Bible, nothing but the Word, no opinions. And it was powerful. It and really started speaking to you. Yeah, and um, I thought, you know, there is something still out there. And but I did go through years of struggle, and it wasn't till just a few years ago, my wife and I had went to a Christian funeral. This was a funeral of a friend you had that had uh, passed away. Uh, my wife's nephew, actually. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us about that. He'd passed away, and you know. Not thinking much of anything, we we had gotten married and have a daughter, um, and done anything. You know, our Sundays were our adventure day. We <laughs> never talked about religion. My wife said, you know, that looking back, she thought when we got married, you know, I would never go to church, anything like that. She knew how I felt about church. Was she LDS? She was. Okay. Yep, she was. She converted a, in her late teens, just so for not, a couple of years. Not but really active when you were yeah, married. Yeah, she so just. You, Spent Sundays enjoying Sundays and yeah. so on. Okay, so you go to this funeral. Go to this funeral, and somewhere in the funeral, the pastor leads everyone. It was a big, beautiful funeral. Pastor leads everyone in the sinner's prayer. I didn't know what it was then, but he's kind of leading everyone. You know, take Christ as your Savior and promise to Him. And you'd um, never heard that before, I'll bet. Never heard it, but I, I had nothing to lose. I remember thinking, I don't know where to go. So, you know, I went along and said it. Yeah. And I think, I just remember thinking in my mind that this, it was my, I was just begging. Please, something. Give me something. Teach me. Yeah. And yeah. so I just, I surrendered. I gave up. That's wow. how I feel like it was. It was a surrender. A real born again moment and yeah. born of the Spirit. It was. And was it just something that uh, was overwhelming, I guess? Did your it, wife it feel was, the same? A, a little bit then. She kind of had her own experiences elsewhere, yeah. but not as powerful as that. To, but it was, I mean, within hours, I'd forgotten about it and moved on. And you know what I mean? Really? I, okay. I just, it wasn't something where I'm like, wow, this and this happened, but it was something I was keeping inside, you know? Yeah. And I thought, I'll just go on with normal life again. Um, but I was different. You just knew it then. You yeah. Were, well, yeah. that's wonderful. So what what was the next thing that happened? Did you start going to a church? And the, no. The, the next thing, it just we I just had this desire to worship. It just got stronger and stronger. Um, my wife, kind of the same thing. She she wow. just both after that like became closer and closer. We so I started seeking churches. Okay. I thought, well, you know, and, and also my daughter was getting a little older, and I. I remember one day we, my wife and I were talking, and it was, I, I knew one day I'd be accountable for what I taught her. That's a responsibility it we was. all take seriously. And yeah, and, I, and we talked about that, and I, and I knew I would be accountable. 
and I thought I cannot, no matter how comfortable it is, no matter how easy it is to morph back into Mormonism, which is the, what I wanted to do, I tried to start to make that work. I thought we can just do that. It's easy. There's youth groups. I mean, here we are in Orem, Utah. Yeah. You know, I said, this, that's going to be the best thing. She's probably going to be raised there. And I couldn't do it. I absolutely knew. You just it, knew the it, church wasn't true. It wasn't anymore. true. And I knew one day I'd be standing in front of my maker and I'd and have to account for that. And you'd already felt that special feeling yep. of Christ in your life. Yep. And you don't, uh, it's hard to explain. It just isn't there in the Mormon church. It's, it's like the scales come off. Yeah. There's a new relationship with Jesus yep. Christ as God. Yep. And it's just, it's wonderful. There's, I never worshipped before that. Wow. As an LDS person, I never truly worshipped. I never understood the desire to worship. You know, now that's something very real. Like when we, this last Sunday, we were traveling and we didn't get to church and we were both just frustrated. We wanted to go somewhere and sing and, wow. you know, and just praise God. Well, how, how does the Bible compare with you now as from a Latter-day Saint to a, to a Christian? Growing up, I, you know, always had those things that kind of go through the LDS church. It might not be in writing, but it goes through that. The Bible's a little iffy. It, you don't know which verse is translated right. It's a little sketchy. You know, but Mormon doctrine, all that is dead on. It's totally true and blah, blah. So I never had any type of appreciation for it. For the Bible. No. And, and, and now as a Christian. Oh, now it's, it's, it's my joy. You can't yeah. get enough of it. I love the Word, yeah. yeah. I love it. And you're, uh, you go to church then regularly, it sounds like. And yeah. How does that uh, service, that worship service, compare between Mormonism and uh, the uh, well, I'll, Christian. I'll tell you, it was funny. We started praying eventually. We were looking for churches. Nothing felt right. But we started praying for it, which we hadn't prayed in years. Nothing but this. The changes were happening. And uh, it was about two Easter's ago. We got these flyers on our front door and back door, which is strange, but an invitation to Provo First Baptist. Okay. So we're like, hey, that's good enough for me. Let's give, give it, a it a try. Time. and. Both of us, the first day we walked in, it's like that was church. It's talking about the Lord. It's worshiping the Lord. It's just preaching the gospel right from the word. No one's opinions. We're not talking about people. We're not talking about meetings or activities or anything. Just the word, just scripture, just worshiping the Lord. And so we were hooked. <laughs> that was it. Now, interestingly enough, just to follow up on that, you said you went to a, a service just recently of the LDS Church. Except, yeah. Tell us about that just a little bit. I did. I went to um, my nephew's farewell, who I really love. But um, yeah, it, was, it was difficult because we came in and kind of sat in the back. It was overflowing, um, big congregation, you know, and... There's a bunch of young people in the back that were just whispering and talking the whole time. And I sat there as the meeting started, and I listened, and I hadn't been to an LDS meeting in years. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting, waiting for something about Jesus. Something. Please. <laughs> time goes on, and I said to my wife, I'm like, how long has it been? This and this. Start watching the clock. It was 36 minutes before finally his name was mentioned. Wow. 36 minutes. And it's just so different in a Christian so different. church. It's so You wouldn't go five minutes. I mean, yeah. it'd be strange to go five minutes, but 36 minutes, and then it was just because the lady was talking about hymns, and it was mentioned in a title. Oh, really? So his name was mentioned in a title, but yeah, it wasn't until my nephew gave his talk, and he, he talked a little bit about the Savior, which was really nice, but the whole rest of the service, and there's such a vast contrast. It is. Yeah. Even on your mission, did you sense or ever get the feeling that you were representing Christ as much as you were representing the church? No, I didn't. I was more of a church representative, I felt like. Now, this actually struck me after I returned home from my mission, but before I've turned my life to Christ. But I sat back one day and thought, I don't think I really spoke Jesus' name hardly at all on no. my mission. It was all about Joseph Smith, exactly. the plan of salvation, the Book of Mormon, things that Joseph brought forward, yeah. nothing about Jesus and his walk and turning our life over to him. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that was the fir that's the first thing Yeah, you do. You go in and you want to, er, well, you're trained to share the first the, vision, yeah. the Book of Mormon, the restoration of the gospel. And, 
Well, so, yeah, it's, it's sure different. It is. Um, and you mentioned uh, your love for the Bible now and, oh, yeah. and, and having turned your life over to Christ. And explain kind of the joy and peace that that brings compared to Mormonism. I'll tell you something. During my years of being a part, I'm not, I mean, I'm ashamed of it and I regret my sins, but I was the sinner of sinners. I liked to party. I was crazy. I was, you know, it was bad, I, but I was full of sin. And there was a number of years where it was difficult for me to get any sleep without or being sober. You know, I needed to be high or drunk or whatever being wow. to even get to sleep. And like as those things change and change gradually as you mature somewhat, but with Christ in your life, the, you're, you're, the whole life is just different. You have a sense of peace inside. Your anxiety is different. Your view of the world's different. Your it's emphasis so is so different. different. Yeah. You, you can, the best I was ever as an LDS person, it's a completely different thing than when you have that close relationship with Christ. When many, many times a day you're in communication, in prayer, in thought, in worship, that, that desire, like that change of heart where... You know, before I had a constant desire to sin. Constant. And I'm a sinner every day still. And you just explain that away? I mean, obviously the Mormon church denounces that kind of... But is it because of the rules? Or it's the new heart that you have, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the and only I, thing I can explain, And too, I've heard that stuff that, before and it didn't even make any sense. It right. might as well have been said in Japanese. I don't understand it. But experiencing it, it's different. I don't have that desire like I did. So, you know, I don't, don't seek after sin like I was I was mm -hmm. just lustful for sin. Mm -hmm. And that's changed and thank goodness, man, cuz I was burdened with it. And I think that may be the little significant difference between grace and works. It is. Because grace is this gift from God and then we want to serve. We don't want to disappoint our God. Yeah. So we love him, we praise him, we worship him, and then we turn around and, and serve our fellow men to the best of our ability yeah. because we want to, not because we have to or exactly. we're filling some... The works come out of pure intentions. I don't do... Th even my best friends that I go to church with, they want me to come to some meeting and I don't feel like it, I tell them. So I'm not going to go out of obligation. It, my sense, my, I'm not sincere about it. And they understand. I'm going to do things... Yeah, yeah, I do things out of total sincerity. And, and it is, that desire to serve others and love, because I've been forgiven of a lot, a lot, and my love for the Savior is, you know, well, endless. It's just, it's just such joy, such peace, and, and it's almost hard to explain. And unless you've experienced it mm -hmm. and become born again and a new creature, you just don't. And like you said, it's like Japanese to somebody yeah. that doesn't understand what you're talking it about. It sounds ridiculous. And I was one of those people making fun of it when I, I was, was, too. you know, yeah. I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. Saved by grace and snicker, snicker. That's what I was taught growing up, you know. Yeah. And, it's and like, I think oh, what a joke. They, you know. And the Mormons have that perception of Christians that it's kind of eat, drink and be merry and do whatever yeah, you want. Exactly. And it just isn't like that at all. It's not at all. Yeah. It's not at all. Praise God. Well, you mentioned five points that you kind of had questions about, and I don't know we really covered these much, but uh, you do sense that the, the Mormons diminish the Christ, diminish his, his godhood and, and what he did for us. Any yeah, thoughts on that? Just, just before, what I thought of Jesus was, it was nice, but it was kind of sacred, and he was kind of put away, but a nice older brother that's going to, you know, he's going to help us out when we can't quite reach but we need to be obedient. And, I mean, it, it's heresy. It's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. Totally different. Because his, when, when you go through that born-again experience, when God reaches down in that pit and pulls you out, and you realize who he is. And you know you're saved by yes. grace, and it's a gift from God, and you can't add anything to mm -hmm. it. Oh, that's and you can never run out of things describing the might of the Lord. Yeah. Well, just a couple of quick questions we have. Uh, should we have a Mormon president? Should the United States have a Mormon president, do you think? Uh, I really dislike politics. <laughs> okay, so let's not <laughs> yeah. dwell on that one. I got none to say. Can, uh, are Mormons Christian? No. And? Or why? I guess we've covered um, it a little bit. But. What I try and explain to LDS people that I, I've gotten pinned down a couple times and I've offended some people on accident, but it's, it's just the same way if, 
you ask an LDS person, are the FLDS Mormon? And they're going to say, of course not. Even though they share 90 share 90 percent of their doctrine and all this stuff, you know, they're not quite Mormon. Well, the same thing. Same with Christian and, and yeah. Christians have a whole different view of Christ and who He is than LDS yeah. people do. And you know, Christians were here first. Yeah. You know. Can, can a Mormon go to heaven? Um, I, not up to me to decide. No, that's a good answer. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, they have a close relationship with. The, okay, with you have Christ. a short time to live. What do you tell the LDS out there? Got a minute? Um, I would say think about that day when you stand absolutely alone um, without your parents, without your spouse, without anybody, but you've got to account for everything. And you think, you know, you've got to explain to your Creator what you did and, and why you did it. And it's not going to be okay to just say, well, that's what I was taught. Um, in the Bible you read, that's not going to be okay. It's not a good enough excuse. I just say do your research and look into it and find out who Jesus Christ really is. Um, what a wonderful testimony, Mariner. Thanks so much for mm -hmm. sharing it with us today. You know, it's, it's just so beautiful, this gospel, and I think people, like you said, open the Bible. They need to determine that it is not trustworthy. Yeah. They should go through and find out for themselves that it hasn't been translated correctly before they get any more serious about, about their walk. Well, we want you to remember, LDS, that uh, you're choosing between the gospel of Joseph Smith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we want you to, to know that uh, you need to make a good choice there. Or it may be, uh, it may be something you may pay for forever. Anyway, thanks for joining us tonight, and we'll, we'll see you next week.